Hi. I'm Philip, and I'm a recovering engineer. So when I heard a colleague use that introduction at a conference for the first time, I thought to myself, huh, that's interesting. Then as I was listening to her talk about her engineering journey and the kind of things that she had experienced, I was thinking, well, maybe I am a recovering engineer too. So I, here I am today, still recovering, but I'm fine. I'm good. So like John mentioned, I am a professor, and one of the things that I like to do as a professor is ask some questions. And so as I'm going through my talk, I would like to ask you all some questions, and I hope that you all will work with me. I really do want to hear your answers and what you have to say. So the first question is a show of hands question. How many people in the room are engineers or consider themselves engineers? Okay, we have some folks. Great, cool, waving. Yeah, hey, hey, how you doing? Um, how many people are non-engineers in the room? Okay. Yeah. How many of you know an engineer? Okay, most of you. Any recovering engineers in the room? One, great, this is good. The next question I'd like to ask, I will mostly direct to those in the front so I can hear your answers, so just shout them out. And then for the rest of you, just think about what your answers would be. So I want to know what comes to your mind when I say the word engineering. Just throw out some answers. Building, okay. Sorry, say again. Manufacturing? No sleep, okay. Money, okay, great. That's a good one. Sorry, say that again. Crazy, okay. Creating, okay, great, cool. So I like to ask this question a lot. Right? The thing with questions like this is you just never know the kind of answers that you're going to get. And usually I get answers like buildings and infrastructure and technology that John talked about earlier, cell phones, electronics, cars, those kinds of things. And every now and then I do hear about crazy and how hard it is and students who are stressing out pulling out their hair. Now one of the things that did not come up, which I do hear a lot too, is the thing that tends to scare some people away from engineering. Math. Right. The numbers, the symbols, the letters that are equal to other letters that no one seems to understand. And I'll get back to these later. So there was a time when I also used to think about things that way. When I hear engineering, I think about the products and the things that uh, we develop. But these days, when I think about engineering, one of the first things that comes to mind is images like this, a person. So that image is of a man named Andrew Viterbi. And my relationship with Viterbi, I don't know the guy, is similar to my relationship with engineering. I had heard about the things that he had developed before I knew who he was. So Viterbi is known for a thing that is called, of all things, the Viterbi algorithm. And what it does is it allows communication systems, like your cell phone, to figure out what it is that the sender, like your cell tower, was telling it when to send the message. Because whenever you send a message over the air or over a wire, bad things can happen, the message gets jumbled, and it's the job of the receiver to figure out what was the original message that was sent. A couple of years ago, I read the story of Viterbi and why the algorithm and, and he developed those things. And the story is one of those interesting stories where he just wasn't, he wasn't trying to invent the thing. He just sort of came across it while trying to do something else. So Viterbi was a professor of electrical engineering, like myself, at UCLA. And one of the things that he was tasked with was teaching the communication theory class. And it had been a couple of years, and every year he tries to do this, and he realized the students just weren't getting it. Something was wrong. They, the ideas weren't just getting across. And so like any good teacher, he decided he was going to do something about it. He was trying to gonna figure out a way to get the students to understand the thing that he was trying to teach. So he went back, and he looked at the concepts and the ideas and what people were trying to say in terms of communication systems. And what he found was that people were making the thing way more complicated than it needed to be. And so he developed this algorithm as a way to explain to his students how simple communication systems really are and how did they work. But one of the things he realized was they were also useful for real communication systems. We could actually build things that do that. And so over time, he left his job as a professor, built some co companies, and eventually co-founded a company called Qualcomm, which is one of the big mobile communications companies. And most of the cell phone technology we have uses some, of the, some things like the Viterbi algorithm today. 
By the way, the algorithm is also used in speech recognition systems like Siri and Alexa because all they're trying to do is figure out what it is that you were trying to say to begin with into the microphone. So that's Viterbi. The other image that comes to mind is these engineers. Now, they may not look like engineers, but they really are. Trust me, I know these folks. So the one on my right and your left is my younger brother. He's actually a mechanical engineer. He works for Toyota. And the one on my left and your right is my mom. She is a civil engineer, and she's the one that I'm going to talk about. So what my mom does is she calls herself a transportation specialist. And the thing that she is responsible for on engineering projects is figuring out what is going to be the effect of the road or the bridge or the hospital or the infrastructure that we're going to build. And what is the effect for the users and the people who are in the community who may not be users of, of the particular technology. She's worked on projects like figuring out how it is that the borders in different West African countries are constructed and operated and how does that contribute to the prevalence of HIV AIDS and made some recommendations that's actually helped. Now, the story I want to tell about her is how she got into engineering to begin with. So she was a high school student at the time, trying to figure out what she wanted to do with her life, like most high school students have to do when high school is over. And she was told, well, you're good at math and you're good at science, so maybe you should consider this thing called engineering. Now, she says one of the things that drew her to engineering was at the time, and it still is, a very male-dominated field. So she was about the only lady in her class of about 100 people. One of the things that she was curious about was, what is this thing called engineering that all the guys are excited about that the ladies are missing out on? The other thing that was interesting to her was that she heard that engineering had something to do with the word design. And in her mind, she had always associated the word design with fashion and clothes and those kinds of things. And so she wanted to find out what engineering was. So she went into it, she did it, she came out, and she worked at a number of companies. She now does her own consulting, and those are the kinds of things that she works on. Now, there are two takeaways from these stories that I'd want to highlight. One is, when I think of engineering, I think that it's something that people do. It's a very human thing. Now, the other thing that I think about when I think engineering is why is it that the people do it to begin with? And if you look at Viterbi's story and you talk to engineers or you look at my mom's stories, you'd almost have to conclude that one of the things that engineers are interested in is helping people meet some kind of a need, right? Helping people meet some kind of a need. And that's the other point that I want to run with. So my next question I'm going to direct to you in the front over here. So what I, what I want you to think about and everyone else in the room is as you're standing in front of your wardrobe this morning and you were thinking about what you were going to wear, what were some of the things that were running through your mind? Why did you pick the outfit that you picked today? Oh, okay, that was the only consideration? Okay, so temperature outside and fashion. Great. Cool. So most of us do this, right? So you have to wear something when you walk out, right? So you, you definitely have to pick something. Well. You could wear nothing, but most of us wouldn't be excited about that. Um, and the other thing that you have to do is consider why you're going to pick the clothes that you pick. Most of us don't want to be too hot or too cold, and so we consider the temperature outside when we're, when we're picking our outfits. And then you want to wear something that's appropriate, right? A lot of us don't like to stick out, so we want to wear something that we're comfortable in and something that we won't stick out in. Now. We all do this with a lot of different aspects of our life. And this is one of the things that engineers do. We have a goal, and we have constraints. The goal in this case is you have to wear something. And the constraints are you don't want to be too hot or too cold, and you want to fit in, in, in the particular environment. And so for me, engineering is something that we all do. As, as a concept, we all do this in different ways in our lives. We have our goals, and we have our barriers and our opportunities, and we navigate life that way. And so if engineering as a concept is this human thing, then I think it, it should be accessible to everybody. It should be something that everybody can get involved in. Now, one of the things I do want to touch on is the thing that I mentioned earlier, the thing that scares people away from engineering, the math. 
So I want to ask two questions there. So first question is to you in the front here. We've all had the experience of doing homework or taking an exam and getting our grade back, right? So let's say you did some homework and you got your grade back and your grade was a 9 out of 10. Would you consider that to be a good grade? Absolutely. Great. Cool. Yeah, good. We'll live. So you in the corner over here. Let's assume you did an exam and you got a solid 85 out of 100. Would you consider that to be an OK grade? OK, you'd live with that. The thing that I want you to recognize here is that the number 9 and the number 85 in isolation are two very different numbers. 85 is almost 10 times the number 9. But relative to 9 relative to 10 and 85 relative to 100 is something that gives us the same kind of feeling about the same thing. Now, this is mostly what engineers do with the math and the numbers. At the end of the day, when I'm done with my calculations and I have all the symbols aligned and I have the number, all I want to know is, does this thing work? How well does it work? Does it work any better than it used to? What's the room for improvement? But it's a qualitative judgment that we're about to do at the end of the day. And we all do this in our daily lives. We go to the store and we, s we decide on products, we look at the prices, and we come to some value judgment based on the numbers and, and those kinds of things. And so the point here is engineering as a concept is something that we're all familiar with. But engineering as a profession has taken that concept and developed a specialized set of tools like math and other things for a specialized set of complex problems that we have to all deal with in society. So the takeaway for me here is, if it's something that we're all familiar with, then I think it's something that we all should be having more conversations about. So for the non-engineers in the room, next time you come across an engineer, don't be scared. Say hello. They're people too. <laughs> Ask them what they do and have a conversation with them. And the same thing for the engineers in the room. When you come across someone who's not in your area, who's not an engineer, say hello. Talk to them. They are also people and have a conversation and find out what it is that they do. Because, I, because what's happening, as you've seen in some of the talks, is society is being engineered all around us. Technology is pervasive. And I think that it's when we all get together and talk about this thing that we all do and are familiar with in some way, that we can all come together and help all of us meet the kinds of needs that we have. Thank you.